There's not going to be a cheat sheet for you showing up on the monitor. So you're going to have to pay attention. I figured this way, maybe I'd get some of y'all to, you know, wouldn't go to sleep or something. But uh, I'm not an expert on this uh, topic that we're looking at tonight, depression. Um, that's something I've not really ever been bugged with. I don't, maybe it's because uh, I'm just, you know, so easy going and <laughs> life comes and goes and that's good. The Lord take care of it all. I just don't have to worry about it. But uh, the psalm, the psalmist, David evidently had some real problems with it. Because you notice several of the psalms mention and talks about the, the problems that he's going through and just, just give it all up. There, you know, there's no use any longer. Psalm 42, you know, he's just overwhelmed. And I'm sure that, uh, I mean, if you look at, at society and look at our things the way they're going today, um, it's not a very pretty outlook. No. It, uh, it's pretty bleak. And uh, I don't care if you put Democrat or Republican in there, uh, it's still going to be a pretty bleak outlook. And if you throw in an independent, then it's going to be a pretty bleak output. I mean, we just, you know, I keep praying, you know, you always want to pray positive. You know, Lord, help our nation, send revival, you know, bring us closer to you, revive the church. But sometimes I, I, I guess I get uh, a little cantankerous and I say, Lord, whichever one is going to be the president, make it be the one that's going to start this one world government thing and be the Antichrist and get us out of here. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I know we're supposed to pray for our president and that's sometimes the way I pray for him. Yeah. But you never know. Psalms chapter 77. Psalms chapter 77. I entitled this The Causes and the Cure of Depression. Now, like I said, I'm not an expert. I'm not a, a doctor. and I don't, Because some of the things that we look at in depression are chemical imbalances. And you can do all the things you want to do and, and try the help, self-help and everything, but sometimes it's going to take a medical doctor to help you to get those chemicals back into balance so that you can think positive and think right. But here the psalmist David said, I cried unto God with my voice, and even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. But he says, in the day of my trouble, I saw the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not. My soul refused to be comforted. I remembered God and was troubled. I complained, and my spirit was overwhelmed, Selah. Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Boy, isn't that a problem? I mean, just if you read, if you read verses two, three, and four, it's just, I mean, the psalmist is just in such a low estate. I mean, it's just horrible. Everything's against him. You know, I'm not sure exactly when this psalm was written, but to me, it's, it's like when David may have been chased by Saul, or he may have been in even his own son Absalom that has taken over the kingdom, and here David is being run out by his own son, and so he's got all of this going on, and he's in such despair. But look at verse 7. He said, Will the Lord cast off uh, forever, and will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? I mean, you, you talk about this guy. I mean, he's just down to his last straw, you know. I mean, everything else has gone bad and wrong. I mean, it's just uh, horrible, the situation that he's in. He's give up. He's on his last leg. But notice some of the, um, I think, some of the effects that we see in depression. Some of the causes are that come. So let's note that depression affects us in at least four 
different ways. And of course, there may be others, but we're going to clue on to these four because I find these four here in the Psalm 77. First of all, we're, it has overwhelmed our spirit. You look at verse 3, it said, I remembered God and was troubled. I complained and my soul, my spirit was overwhelmed. Don't you, know, you get it sometimes that in life the problems come and it just seems like there's more, the, more problems than you can handle. Uh, you know, we've always joked about one of the qualifications for being a member of the church is that you have to visit so many doctors, you have to have so many surgeries, you know, got to have a knee replacement, you know, hip replacement. Uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, you, you got to have a train load of prescriptions to keep the pharmacies going. And you've got all of these troubles. Well, let me tell you something. We looked at our schedule for the next, what, next two weeks, no doctor appointments. Amen. Can you imagine? <laughs> we did three of them yesterday, though. <laughs> so maybe they're going to put us on salvation probation since we don't qualify anymore. But here he is, he is just overwhelmed. I mean, life throws things at us, and it, it seems like sometimes it's just more than we can handle. And that's where the psalmist is at. There's just so much there that he is overwhelmed. A second thought is it awakens our memory. Look at verse 6. He says, I call to remembrance my song in the night. I commune with my own heart, and my spirit made diligent search. You know, sometimes those memories aren't so nice. You know, sometimes we, we judge up all the things that can go wrong, all the things that we've seen, all the problems, you know, the one that stabbed us in the back and the one that, you know, spoke ill of us, the one that we thought was our friend it turned out to be our worst enemy and they were just being our friend so they could feed, you know, information to others around us. And so we get, you know, as he says there, he started remembering these things and started causing him to have more problems and couldn't sleep. Number C in your notes there, he says, robs us of sleep. Verse 4 says, thou holdest mine eyes waking. Have you ever, I do that sometimes. I, I, they, I go to that sleep doctor and one of the questions they ask is, how long does it take you to go to sleep? So I, I try to be generous. You know, I say 30 to 45 minutes. And sometimes it takes longer than that. Sometimes, you know, I'll go to bed at 11 and about 1, maybe 1.30 is when I drift off. I'm just laying there. I mean, I could do my eyes awakening. I've not got a problem. Sometimes it's, it's uh, pain that helps keep me awake. But sometimes it's not. And, and, you know, it's just one of the things I've learned here in the last day or two is um, I started using a TENS unit. That's where they send those electrodes and it kind of buzzes your skin and supposed to do some good for getting rid of pain. So I've been wearing a TENS unit some at night, run it for a little while, and that takes my mind to what it's doing and off of thinking about all that's going on and all things that, that need to be done or just wandering around thinking, you know. And so it helps me to go to sleep quicker. You know, I sometimes go to sleep in 30 minutes or more, you know, I mean, just, wow. But here, he says, I've just got so much going on, so many problems, so much is happening that just can't sleep. And isn't that the way depression goes with us? We get our mind racking on all the problems that we've got. And we lay there in bed and all, so all we think about is, oh, this one happened, that's happening, this is going on, and that's going on, and I just can't take it anymore. And then the last one, he says there, it seals our lips. Look at verse 4 again. He says, Thou holdest mine eyes waking. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Now, some of y'all have never been in a situation where you cannot speak. <laughs> Brother Lily, I'm sure, is one of those kind. It's never been in a situation where you couldn't speak. First <laughs> 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 two years. <laughs> I'll bet, I'll bet the day that, I mean, he's probably going to sit up in the ca casket and start preaching, you know. Uh, we, we'll have to be sure that he is gone before we... 
But have you been so depressed you just didn't know what to say? Who do you turn to? What do you tell? There is so much. Where do I start? Of course, they always say start at the beginning, but, you know, we don't have a couple hours. And if you go to a therapist and they charge you, I don't know how much, but, you know, just sometimes you just don't know what to say or what to do. The psalmist was in that shape. I mean, everything has gone wrong. Everything that he thought was going good and, and was beneficial has seemed to turn against him. Now he don't even know what to say. He's so troubled that he cannot speak. So that's how depression affects us. So what's the most common cause of depression? Well, let's look at those here. I think first it is a morbid, pessimistic outlook on life. You know those type of people, don't you? Look at verse 2. In the day of my trouble, I sought the Lord. My sore ran in the night and ceased not my soul refused to be comforted. Is, you can't do a thing to make life easy for me. You can't take any problem. I've got so many problems, you couldn't take them all. You couldn't help me a bit. That's what he's looking at here. He says, my sore run in the night and my, it ceased not and my soul refused to be comforted. You know, there's some people that you just cannot help. I heard that on years ago on Channel 3. They was interviewing this guy and they was talking about something going on and he said, it's just some people refuse to be helped. And that's what the psalmist is into here. He said, my soul refused any advice, any help uh, somebody was talking last night about trying to witness to somebody in their different denomination, and the guy just wouldn't hear it. He said every time, nope, nope, that's just, you know, he wouldn't listen. He refused to be helped. He refused to listen to something other than what his church taught him. And sometimes we get in that way that we just refuse any assistance whatsoever. I get that way sometimes. I handle it myself. I, I was uh, brought up where you did your own. You didn't go out and, you know, I've got a good neighbor that helps. Anytime I've got a problem that I can't get to, can't fix it, and I fuss, fuss, and fuss, and fuss, and fuss over it, I just go over there and say, can you come take a look at this? He walks over there in three seconds, he's got it fixed. <laughs> Who knows? But a pessimistic outlook on life. Have you seen people like that? The, the glass is always half empty. I mean, things should be going great. People are in church and excited about church. And then there's that one. Well, just wait till that other shoe drops. It can't last. These people, they won't come back. You know that. It's been that way here all the time. And they're just always down and depressed. Never any joy, never any life. There, uh, uh, one, one person I read after said, they live life in the minor key. <laughs> and, you know, I just said, well, Christian shouldn't be that way. As a Christian, we ought to be always happy, always joyful. I mean, even if we're in the middle of a problem, I mean, even the, the world is against us and everything is going wrong. We should still have joy because look who's in control of it. Somebody said the other day that uh, they're not worried because God has determined the day when they're going to die and there's nothing anybody can do till that day comes. And there's nothing you can do to stop it. The Lord is, you know, so I said, yeah, the Lord's in control, isn't he? He knows. And so if you're in the middle of God's will, just go full blast for it. Amen. Because God will watch over you and protect you. If that's his will, it may be his will for you to meet the undertaker too. So let's always be in his will. He's in control. So it's a pessimistic outlook on life. And secondly, there is an offending conscience. Look at verse 3. I remember God and was troubled. How about that now for a life? I remember God and, buddy, that just tore me up. I, you know, 
I can imagine him as he's sitting there and he's thinking about, oh, God, yes, that's right. We have a God that, oh, wait a minute. There's this sin and there's that sin and I didn't do this that he wanted me to do and I didn't go there and I didn't witness to this one and, and on and on. And he said, I remembered God and was troubled. He said, I complained and my spirit was overwhelmed. You know, has there been some things in your life when you thought about who God was that it made you a little tr trembling and a little fearful? I think of that um, sermon by Wesley, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And I think of another one that he should have followed death on that and is Christians in the Hands of an Angry God. Because we fail to do what he wants us to do. We fail in our life. And, of course, y'all know that I am perfect. Almost. I've got maybe <laughs> one or two little flaws. But for, you know, I'm 99% pure perfection, you know. Um, what about that other one? <laughs> well, that other one gives me the problem. <laughs> if you just got, if you just offend in one law, in one point of the law, then you're guilty of all the law. Well, that's me. And of course, I've, that uh, one causes me to do more and causes me to do more. And sometimes I think, well, it, oh boy, it'll be nice just to, die and, and go to heaven and be out from all of these problems. And then I stop and think, yeah, then I'm going to stand before God. He's going to look at me and say, well, you didn't do this. I wanted you to go there and you didn't. And you did this and that's, uh, that's a no-no. You shouldn't have done that. So what it'll be for a Christian to stand before God? How many of us are going to be whooping, hopping, and I've got all these crowns when we stand before God and he starts showing us, here's where you failed me. This is what I wanted you to do and you didn't do it. Here's where you ran. So he remembered God and he trembled. So evidently he didn't have a clear conscience, did he? Acts 24, 16 says, and herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void to offense between God and toward man. But that's a hard one to live up to, isn't it? But that's what we should do. Um, remember, the Holy Spirit's with you always. You know, there's some things we won't do at church. Um, when I grew up, <clears throat> church was holy. The building itself was holy. It was dedicated and sanctified, set apart for church. And you didn't run up and down the aisles. I've been tripped a lot of times by daddy picking me up by the seat of my pants and grabbing me and said, sit down here. You don't run in God's house. And of course, I understand this is just a building. This is not really the church. You and I, the individuals, we are the church. The Holy Spirit, the, the, the Bible tell, calls us the temple of God. Why? Because God lives and indwells in each of us that are his children. So what you say we can't do here in the house of God, in the church that we call it, if you go outside and you do it, then you're grieving the Holy Spirit. And you're going to have that same thought, when I remember God, I will be troubled. But not only that, there is a complaining spirit. There in verse 3 he said, I complained. Boy, don't we love to do that. I mean, that's top notch for us, isn't it? We complain. <coughs> you didn't treat me right. You didn't do what this. You didn't. Uh, what was it, Sunday we went to uh, Wendy's? Or was it Monday? Saturday? Saturday. We went to Wendy's because Wendy's in the app, you could get a double... Wendy's hamburger for two dollars and fourteen cents, and that's tax included. So you know what we do? We like to get the cheap stuff. You know, you know, get it on sale. So we decided that's what we're going to do. We're going to, you know, she went to buy groceries and she was going to stop in. So she called and told me I'm going to Wendy's. And so I opened my app up and I punch in there. I want this sandwich and I want it for, you know, 
the sales price, and so I hit the sale button there and come back weird looking. So I tried it again, and I said, there's something wrong with this. It's not working. So Sandy went in and talked to him and said, look, there are three charges on our Discover app where we've tried to buy this hamburger three times, and it, I think finally they're going to go send us a check for those three times that we tried to do it. <laughs> but you talk about we got something to complain about. We missed a $2 hamburger because it sells off now. You know, that's the way the world treats you. But don't we love to complain? I mean, you know, and there's some people that they take joy in complaining. I mean, if they, they complain about everything, even if it's going right, they complain. He said, I complained, and he groaned, and he moaned, and I kind of like to get away from those type of people. Next, he said, it's, uh, there's too much unhealthy introspection. Look at verse 6. I called to remembrance my song in the night. I communed with my own heart and my spirit and made diligent search. If you ever just sit down trying to go to sleep, boy, you just start thinking all these things and you're thinking, what am I doing? What am I up to? You know, where do I go from here? You start thinking, what, what have I done? to deserve God's punishment like this? What, what sin have I committed that God hates me so that he's making me go through all this? And so we start looking at ourselves, you know, of course I'm perfect, and so if something happens to me, God must have made a mistake. <laughs> because, you know, I'm one of his choice. But don't we sometimes get in that unhealthy mode of looking Sometimes though it can be good, Lamentations 3.40 says, let us search and try our ways and turn again to God. Psalms 139.23 and 24 says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me into the way of everlasting. So sometimes though we forget the God part and we just worry and worry and worry all of ourselves about it. Then last there it says the leaving God out of our reckoning. We a lot of times forget God, don't we? So look at verses 7 and 9. He says, will the Lord cast off forever? Will he be favorable no more? Is his mercy clean gone forever? Doth his promise fail forevermore? Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? Selah. Boy. Has God forgot about us? Sometimes we probably get that way. We get to thinking that, you know, there's nothing. God's prayers don't even reach the ceiling. We try to find something in the Bible and it just looks all confused and we just don't understand what's God up to. Why is God treating me this way? So we leave God out of our reckoning. Now, of course, we must realize that in depression there are sometimes that um, there can be physical problems. There can be the chemical imbalances. Good health is the enemy of depression. And bad health is the friend of depression. So you need to take care of yourself, you know. Get lots of uh, the right types of food and get a lot of the exercise. Exercise. Let me scratch my head. Think about that one again. Let me. Maybe I. Maybe I missed. Maybe I missed that one. But uh, you feel better when you get up and you move about. Of course, us old retired people, we like to sit down and you know do nothing. But uh, you know, it, it helps to get up and move and to get a little of that exercise. At the end of that verse 9 there, he says, Hath God forgotten to be gracious? Now, or hath he in anger shut up his tender mercies? And then that next little word is selah, which means just pause and think about that for a moment. Has God really forgotten me? 
And if we'll stop and just think about it for a moment, we'll find the cure for depression. So if we've got the happy life, we've got the exercise life, and we're doing the, getting the right amount of sleep and the right amount of relaxation and fun and all of this, what's the cure for when we do find ourselves in depression? First, I think we need to admit and confess it at once. You know, the, the longer we hold sin in our lives, the harder it is to go confess it to the Lord. The more you miss church, the easier it is not to go to church. Uh, I used to walk quite, quite frequently, like every day, up to the Blue Hole, up the Sitton Gulch Trail, Canyon in Cloudland and Canyon State Park. And I would do that every day. I mean, just zip up there a mile, back a mile. And then last year after we had the, the lightning strike here at the church and I started spending more afternoons at the church trying to get things moving, get things arranged, arra rearranged and all, the walking kind of went by the wayside. And uh, so the pants have gotten a little tighter. I don't know why. It must have shrunk in the wash or something. I don't know what that is. But I thought, I've been thinking, well, I've got to get back out and start walking again. And uh, I'm going to start that tomorrow. Whenever tomorrow gets here, it's when I'm going to start. But, you know, I was going to start yesterday. I said I'd start it tomorrow. Well, it's not tomorrow yet. Tomorrow's tomorrow. So, you know, I'm going to have to wait till tomorrow gets here before I can walk. So, <clears throat> look what he said in verse 10. And I said, this is my infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. I may be having problems now, but just remember what God has done, where God has brought you from, Amen. all the things that God has done for you over there. I mean, you don't even, God has, all he has to do is just save your soul, and that ought to be enough. I mean, you don't have to think about all the times that he saved your life and kept you out of this problem and helped you out with that one. Yes. All you need to just remember back, what we used to sing that song, Roll Back the Curtain of Memory, Now and Then. Show me where I could have been. You know, we just need to look back and say, Lord, I know you're there. You're the same God that was with me when I was on the mountaintop. You're the same God today when I'm in the valley. Right. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10 said, I said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ rest, may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. But y'all never had anything like the Apostle Paul. Sometimes, you know, Sandy and I have pretty good health. I mean, you know. We have a few doctor problems here. We got a few problems there. But when I stop and look at some of the others around, the things that they're facing, the things that they're going through, it's like the guy that's complaining about having no shoes to wear until he met a man with no feet. So we have to stop complaining about all of our problems. The Lord's been good to us. Paul said, for when I am weak, then I am strong. Yes. So secondly, we need to seek God in the sanctuary, he says. Look at verse 13. He says, Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary, who is so great a God as our God. I mean, there's no God like our God. He is the God of all God. So we should seek him in the sanctuary. In other words, we need to have a place of prayer where we can meet with him privately. You know, he says in Matthew 6, when you go into your closet and shut the door, no one else is around, then you can really pour out your heart to God and tell him all, bear all your soul to him. But then we also need that corporate prayer, Acts 4.23, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. So they met together for prayer. 
So we need this corporate time of prayer, which we'll do in a few minutes here at our church. But then there's uh, always that friend or a loved one that we can depend on. Because he says in Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am in the midst. Yes. So a third way is we need to encourage ourselves in the Lord. Look at verse 10. And I said, this is my infirmity. I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. David said, I, God was with me at all times. Look at verse 11. He said, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. Man, just start bringing all those things. Like verse 12. I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of thy doings. Verse 14. Thou art the God that does wonders. Thou hast declared thy strength among the people. But he what a just to recall those things that God has done in your life and for you. Daniel was 1 Samuel chapter 3 or 30 verse 6. He said, and David was greatly distressed for the people spake of stoning him because the souls of all the people was grieved. Every man for his son and for his daughter. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. But that's what we need to do sometimes is when we get into those doldrums and we get to the dark places we just need to encourage ourselves in the Lord <clears throat> then last we need to testify to others of the Lord's doings but if you want to get out of depression and get out of that just go find somebody and start talking to them yeah. he said there in verse 12 I will meditate also of all thy works and talk of all thy doings so if you're depressed or you're down just go out and find somebody and say, hey, look, it's what the Lord has done for me. And buddy, that'll lift your heart, lift your soul, and get you out of that dark depression. In Isaiah chapter 28, this was from our, and I'll close with this. This was from our Faith Bible Institute last night, our class. We're studying in the book of Isaiah. And uh, in chapter 28, beginning down in verse 22, he starts talking about all these things that, you know, has happened, all the problems. He says, verse 24, Doth the plowman plow all day to sow? Doth he open and break the clods of the ground? When he hath made plain the face thereof, doth he not cast about the fitches and scatter cumin and cast the principal wheat and the appointed barley and the rye in their place? And he starts talking about, well, this is what the farmers do. They have to get that field ready. They have to plow it up. They have to get it so they can sow the seeds. But then he goes on to say, in the let down part, uh, verse 27, he says, For the fetches are not threshed with a threshing instrument, neither is a cartwheel turned about upon the cumin, but the fetches are beaten with, out with a staff and the cumin with a rod. Bread corn is bruised, but he will not ever be threshing it, nor break it with, a steel, with the wheel of his cart, nor bruise it with the horseman. And what he's saying there is, Every one of us are a wheat or a cumin or a, the fetches, which is a different type of grain. It says it takes certain things to break us. We're not all wheat. We're not all corn. And the Lord knows what it needs. He needs to take and break our hearts and break our spirits and mold us to what he wants to do. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, there is no temptation that has taken you but as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but he will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So the problems you have, the difficulties, the depression, God is able to help you through it and to bring you through it. Amen. Brother Lee. Amen. And that's what our people said. Amen. Aren't you glad you came tonight? Amen. You know, some people come to the house of the Lord and they miss out on a, a wonderful thing. And tonight, you can walk away from here saying it was a blessing to be in the house of the Lord because I heard something from the Word of God that will help me to be a better Christian when I walk through those doors. That's what it's all about, isn't it? Yeah. It sure is. Well, you that joined us uh, through the internet, thank you very much for coming and, and tuning in to our 
uh, our Bible study and thank the Lord for Brother Byron Thompson. And right now, what we're going to do, we just uh, will uh, wish you a, the best. And you tune in this coming Sunday at 11 o'clock for our, our morning worship service. If you can't get in church, but if you can, and you're close enough to join us here at our church, we'd really appreciate you coming and we'd welcome you in so many ways. God bless you.